The Blaze Radio Network. On demand. Glenn Beck. The Blaze Radio Network. I have been um, immersing myself in, um, in future tech to try to understand uh, what is coming our way and what the, the moral issues are um, of the near future, um, what it means um, to each of us in our lives, what it means to, to be asked the question, am I alive? Is this life? We have so many questions that we have to answer, and we're having trouble with just some of the basic things, and no one is really thinking about the future. When you think about the future and you think about robots or you think about AI, Americans generally think of the Terminator. Well, that's not necessarily what's going to happen. How do we educate our kids so I've been reading a lot of uh, high-tech stuff, and, and I've, in my spare time, been trying to read some novels, and uh, I'm looking for the storytellers, the people who can actually tell a great story that is really based in what is coming. Um, the, 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 the futurist or the, the near-future sci-fi authors that can show us what's on the horizon. And I found a series of books. Um, it's called the, um, the Singularity Series. And I found them over the Christmas vacation, and I've, I just last night finished the fourth one. Um, and they are really, really well done. They, are, they get a little dark, but it also shows the positive side of what could be. And it was a balanced look and a way to really understand the future that is coming and is on the horizon. William Hurtling is the author, and uh, he's, he joins us now. William, how are you, sir? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me on. C- um, congratulations on a, um, a really good series. This is self-published? Yep, it is self-published. Uh, I could not find a publisher who uh, saw the vision of the series. But um, I've self-published it, and uh, people love it. So get you get the word out there. Yeah, you've you've won uh, several awards uh, for it, and uh, I hope uh, you know. I don't know what your sales have been like, but I hope your sales are really good um, because I I think it. Um, well, let me ask you this: What was the intent of the series for you? The you know what happened was. In- about 10 years ago, I read two books back to back. One was Ray Kurzweil's The Singularity is Near, mm-hmm. um, which I know you've read as well. Yep. And the other one was Charles Strauss's Accelerando, which is a fictional book about the singularity. And what I realized at that point in time was that we had the biggest set of changes that were ever going to face humanity, and they were coming, and they were in the very near future. Right? They're certainly coming in my lifetime. They're probably coming within the next 10 years. And there's very little out there about that. And as you said, most of the stories that are in media today are about these Terminator-style stories. AI rise up, they take control over the machines, and we fight them in a battle, which, of course, makes for a great movie. I mean, I would love to see the Terminator many times over. But um, what happens when it's not like that? What happens when it's sort of the quiet AI kind of story? And that's really what I wanted to explore. Um, What happens when there's this moment of emergence of the first AI that's out there, and people realize they're being manipulated by some entity, and what do they do about it? How do they react? So uh, uh, I, I find this, uh, first of all, you're, you lay it out so well, and you, you start, the first book starts with the emergence of, uh, of AI, um, and, uh, and then moves, I think the next book is what, 10 years later, five years later? Uh, They're all 10 years apart, yeah. So ten... you can basically explore different points in technology in the future. Right. So the last one is in the 2040s or 2050s, and it's a very different thing then than it starts out as. Um, and yeah. the thing I, I, I wanted to talk to you about is, um, first of all, can, can you just define, because most people don't know the difference between AI, AGI, and ASI, which is really important to understand. 
sure. So AI is out there today. It's any time programmers write a piece of software that instead of having a set of rules, you know, if you see this, then do that. Instead, it's the AI software is trained to make decisions on its own. So AI is out there today. It's how you have self-driving cars. It's what selects the stories that you read in Facebook. Um, it's how Google search results come about. And AGI is this notion that artificial intelligence will become more general, right? All of those things I mentioned are very specific problems to be solved. How to drive a car is a very specific problem. So, but so a good, a good like a human being, a good explanation of AI would be Big Blue, the the chess playing IBM robot. It it has no general intelligence. It does that exactly. Right. Okay. Right, and, and we have uh, IBM's Watson, which is really good at making diagnoses about cancer, but you can't have a conversation about how you're feeling. Right. <laughs> but a AGI would. AGI would appear to be like a human being, conceivably, in that it could talk and reason about a wide variety of topics, make decisions, generally use its intelligence to solve problems that it hasn't even seen before. Now, AGI can pass the Turing test? Yeah, so the Turing test is this idea that you've got um, a person in one room chatting with someone in another room, and they have to decide, is that a human being or is it a computer? And if they can't figure it out, um, then that is the Turing test. Um, and that you've passed the Turing test if you can't distinguish between a computer and, per and a person. How close are we to that? Well, I think we've probably all been fooled at least a few times when we've either gotten a phone call or made a phone call and we think that uh, we're talking to a human being on the other end, right? But it actually turns out that we're talking to a machine that routes our phone call somewhere. So, you know, we're there for like a couple of sentences, but we're still pretty far away if you're going to have any kind of a meaningful conversation. And AGI is when a computer has the computing power of a human brain. Yep. Okay. Now, that's not necessarily a scary thing, but it's what happens when you go from AGI to ASI, artificial super intelligence, and that can happen within a matter of hours, correct? It can. There's a couple of different philosophies on that, but if you can imagine that... Uh, Think about the computer that you have today versus the computer you had 10 years ago, right? It's vastly more powerful, vastly more powerful than the one you had 20 years ago. So even if there's not these super rapid accelerations in intelligence, even if you had just today had a computer that was the intelligence of a human being, you would imagine that 10 years from now, it's going to be able to think about vastly more stuff, much faster, Right, So we could see even just taking advantage of increasing in computing power, we would get a much smarter machine. But the really dangerous, or not necessarily dangerous, the, the, part, the really rapid change comes from when the AI can start making changes to itself. So if you have today programmers create AI, but in the future AI can create AI, and the smarter the AI gets, then in theory the smarter the AI it can build. Um, and that's where you can get this thing that kind of spirals out of control. So you get a handle on how fast uh, this can all change. If you have an Apple iPad 2, that was one of the top five supercomputers in 1998. Okay? That was a yeah. top five supercomputer. Uh, that's how fast technology is is growing on itself. Uh, William Hurtling is an author and a futurist. He is the author of what's called the Singularity Series. It's a, a series of four novels that kind of break it down and tell you exactly what's coming and, and break it down in an entertaining fashion. Um, I highly recommend uh, the Singularity Series. If you are interested in any of this, you need to start reading that. You will really enjoy it. William, uh, I know Glenn is a big fan of your work and has been reading a lot about technology. I, I think a lot of people 
who are living their daily lives don't aren't as involved in this. You know, I think a third or a half of the audience when you hear AI don't even you know even connect that to artificial intelligence until you say it. I know as a uh, long term NBA fan, I think Allen Iverson. <laughs> Honestly, when I hear AI. Um, so can, can you make the case of with everything going on in the world, why should people put this at the top of the priority list? Well, uh, it's the scale of the change that's coming. And probably the nearest thing that we're really going to see is over the next five years, we're going to see a lot more self-driving cars and a lot more, more automation in the workplace. So I think transportation jobs account for something like 5% of all jobs in the United States. And whether you're talking about driving a car, uh, a taxi, uh, driving a delivery truck, all of those things are potentially going to be automated, right? This is one of the first really big problems that AI is tackling, and AI is good at it. So AI can drive a car, and it can do a better job. It doesn't get tired. Uh, It doesn't go out and drink before it drives, and it doesn't make mistakes. Um, Well, that's not quite true. It's going to make mistakes, but it's going to make less mistakes than your typical human operator. So it's, um, you know, business likes to save money and it likes to do things efficiently and self-driving cars are going to be more cost effective. They're going to be more efficient. So what happens to those 5% of the people today who have transportation jobs, right? Um, This is probably going to be the biggest thing that affects us. I think, think, William, you know, it's, it's Silicon Valley um, had better start telling the story um, in a better fashion because as these things hit, we all know politicians on both sides. They're just they'll they'll blame somebody. They're telling everybody that I'm going to bring the jobs back. The jobs aren't coming back. In fact, many many more are going to be lost, not to China, but by robotics and and AI. And when that happens, uh, you know I can see you know politicians turning and saying it's these robot makers. It's this AI people. Yeah, naturally. Um, And yet, unfortunately, the AI genie is out of the bottle, right? Because we're investing in it. China's investing in it. Um, Tech companies around the world are investing in it. If we stop investing in it, even if we said, hey, we don't want AI, we don't like it, all that's going to do is put us at a disadvantage compared to the rest of the world. So it's not like we can simply opt out. It's not really, we don't have that option. It's moving forward. So we need to participate in it and we need to shape where it's going. And I think this is the reason why it's so important to me that more people understand what is AI and why it matters. Because we need to be involved in a public conversation about what we want society to look like in the future. I, I think As we go out, if even more jobs are eliminated by AI, what does that mean? What if we don't have meaningful work for people? I think that um, the thing I like about um, uh, your book series is it starts out really hopeful um, and it shows um, that, you know, this technology is not going to be something that we really are likely to refuse because it's going to make our life incredibly stable and easy in some ways. Talking to William Hurtling, uh, he is the author and futurist, the author of uh, many books. Uh, his latest is The Kill Process. But I'm talking to him about the uh, Singularity series. Um, uh, and the first one in there is the Avogadro Corp. And it is um, it, it starts out around this time and it starts out with a, you know, a, a tech center in um, uh, Portland and a guy is working on a program that will help everybody with their email. And all of a sudden he makes a couple of changes and unbeknownst to him, it uh, grows into something that is thinking and acting and uh, changing on its own. And uh, William, I'd like you to take us through this because the, f- the first book starts out really kind of positive where you're looking at this and is there some spooky consequences, but you're looking at it and going, you know, I can see us. I, I'd kind of like that. And by the end, in the fourth book, you know, we have all been digitized and we're in a, you know, a missile (laughs) leaving the solar system because uh, Earth is lost. Uh, A, do you think this is, is this your prediction or you just think this is a really kind of good story? Well, you know, I think a lot of, I think a lot of it has the potential to be real. And I think one of the things you probably know from my reading is that I'm fairly balanced in what I see as both the risks and the benefits. I think there's both. Um, I 
get very upset. There are so many people that are very dogmatic about artificial intelligence in the future, and they either say, hey, it's either all benefits and there are no risks, or they only talk about the risks without the benefits. Yeah. And, you know, and there's a mix of both, and it's like any other technology, right? We, we all don't know. love our smartphones. We all find our smartphones to be indispensable. And at the same point in time, they affect us, right? And they have negative effects. And society is different today than it was 10 years ago but this, because of our smartphones. Th- this is different, though, than uh, than anything else that we've seen, uh, like a smartphone, because this is this is like a, you know, an alien intelligence. We don't have any way to predict what it's going to be like or what it's going to do because it will be thinking and it most likely will not be thinking like a human. But can we start at the beginning where just give me some of the the benefits that are going to be coming in the next, you know, let's say 10 years that that people are going to have a hard time saying no to? Sure. I mean, first of all, we already talked about self-driving cars, right? I think we'd all like to get into our car and be able to do what we're doing, whatever we want to do and not have to think about driving. That's going to free us up from a mundane task. We're going to see um, a lot more automation in the workplace, which means that the cost of goods and services is going to go down. So we're going to be able to get more for less. So that's going to seem like an economic boom to those of us that can afford it, right? We are going to enjoy more things. We are going to have better experiences when we interact with AI. So today, if you have to go to the doctor, you're going to wait to get a doctor's appointment. You're going to go in. You're going to have this rushed experience more than likely, at least here in the U.S., right? And um, you're going to get five minutes of their time, and you're hoping that they're going to make the right diagnosis in that five minutes that they're with you. Um, That's going to be, I think, one of the really big changes over five to ten years from now is we're going to see a lot more AI-driven diagnosis. So when you're having medical issues, you can go in and you can talk to an AI that will be more or less indistinguishable from talking to the nurse when you walk into the doctor's office. And by the time the doctor sees you, there'll already be a diagnosis made by the AI and it'll likely be more accurate than what the doctor would have done. And all they're going to do is sign off on it. Yeah. I, I, I had a, I had a hard time until I started reading about Watson. I had a hard time believing that, uh, you know, people would accept uh, something from a machine, but they are so far ahead of doctors. If they're fed enough information, they're so far ahead on, you know, predicting cancer and, and diagnosing cancer than people are. I think it's going to be a quick change. You're going to want to have the AI diagnose you. Right, because that's going to be the best, right? When right. we go to the doctor, we want the best. We don't want the second best. Um, so we're going, to see, we're going to see a lot of that. And then, you know, 10, 15 years out, we start, and you know, it's funny. I had a conversation with my daughter one day, and she asked, "Hey, Dad, when am I going to get to drive a car?" Hmm. And I thought about her age, and I thought about um, that, and I was like, "Well, I'm not sure you're ever going to get to drive a car because, you know, where you are and when self-driving cars are coming, um, you may never drive a car, and so you'll just get in one, and it'll take you where you want to go. So there's going to be these very Sort of, they're, they're both subtle and yet dramatic changes in society when you think about, hey, we're going to have a generation of people who may never learn how to drive a car, right? Their time will be freed up to do other things, but um, you, they'll, uh, they'll be do, different than we are. Do you see the, you know, in, in your first um, book, you, you talk about, um, you know, AI changing, you know, the uh, emails that are being sent and doing things on its own and really manipulating people. We are already at the point to where we accept the manipulation of what we see in our Facebook feed, but that's not there's 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 there that's not a machine trying to do anything but give us what we want. Um, right? Are, are do you see us um, very far away from uh, you know hedge fund computers that that can really manipulate the markets in a positive way, or computers that can begin to uh, manipulate for peace, as you put in your book, your first one? It's a good question. Um, we're definitely going to see that. We're going to, at, least, at a minimum, right, where we can imagine that if you have an authoritarian government, they're going to distribute information to pacify people. And that's not a good thing often, but in some ways it is. I mean, you know, if you have armed unrest, people will die. So there's a balance there. 
Um, I think what we're going to see is we're just going to see lots of different people using technology in lots of different ways. So maybe we don't have a, you know, a hedge fund manipulating the markets in a positive way. Maybe it starts with um, a bunch of hackers uh, in another country manipulating the markets to make money, right? But I think we're, we are going to see that distribution, that, that manipulation of information. And it's hard. It's out there now, right? There's content, a lot of the content that you read on the web, whether it's a review of a restaurant or a business, mm -hmm. a lot of that is already generated by AI. And it's hard to tell what's an AI versus a person talking a genuine uh, review talking to William Hurtling he's uh, author and futurist author of uh, a great series of novels called uh, the singularity series um William the um uh, the 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 idea that um intelligent um, not AI not narrow AI but you know um super intelligence or um, uh, artificial general intelligence just kind of comes out of nowhere as it does in your first um, novel where it wasn't the intent of the programmer uh, is interesting to me. I, I sat with a um, one of the a, a bigger name uh, from Silicon Valley just last week uh, and we were talking about this and he said, it, whoever controls AI, whoever gets this first is going to control the world. He was talking to me privately about um, a need for almost a Manhattan project for this. Do you see this as something that's just going to be sprung on us or will it be uh, taken, you know, in a lab intentionally? I, I think the odds are probably strongly biased towards in a lab. Um, both because they have the kind of deeper knowledge and expertise and also because they have the kind of raw computing power, right? So the folks at Google are going to have millions of times more computing power than someone who's outside of a company like Google. So um, that alone, it's like they have the computers that we'll have in 15 to 20 years, right? That kind of computing power. And that makes AI a lot easier of a problem to solve. So I, I think it's most likely to come out of um, a lab. If you're looking at, for instance, the lawsuit that was just filed with um, uh, against Google about the way they uh, treat people with different opinions, uh, et cetera, et cetera. My first thought is, good God, what are those people putting into the programming? Um, I mean, that 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 doesn't <laughs> that doesn't work out well for people. It, it, are, is there enough? Are there enough people that are concerned about what this can do and what this can be that we have the safeguards with people? You know, I um, I really think we don't. I mean, think about the transportation system we have today and the robust set of safety mechanisms we have around it, right? So um, we want to drive from one place to another. We have a system of streets. We have laws that govern how you drive on those streets. We have traffic lights. Cars have anti-lock brakes, they have traction control, all these things designed to present, prevent an accident. If you get into an accident, we have all these harm reduction things, right? We have seat belts and airbags and crumple zones. And after the fact, we have, all this, we have a whole system of mitigation, right? We have ambulances and paramedics and hospitals to take care of what damage does result. And in the future, we're going to need that same sort of very robust system for AI. And we don't have anything like that today. And nobody's really um, thinking about it, um, uh, which nobody's is thinking. Yeah, nobody's thinking about it comprehensively. And one thing you could imagine is, is, well, we'll wait until we have a problem and then we'll put those safety mechanisms in place. Well, the problem, of course, is that AI operates at the speed of computers, <laughs> not at the speed of people. Um, and there's a scene in one of my books, I'm sure you remember reading it, where there's a character who witnesses a battle between two different AI factions. Yes. And the whole battle takes place. A lot of things happen between the two different AI factions, all in the time it takes the human character's adrenaline to get pumping. And by the time he's like primed and ready to fight, the battle is over and they're into negotiations and, and how to resolve it. Right. It is. It is. Uh, it's remarkable in reading that. That is a great um, uh, understanding of, of uh, how fast this will, things will move 
It's it's uh, like one of the best action novels of war scenes I've ever seen. Really, really good, you know, page after page after page of stuff happening. And you get to the end and you realize, oh, my gosh, this the human hasn't even hardly even moved. He hasn't even had a chance to think about the first step that happened. And it's already over. Exactly. So this is this is why we need to be thinking about how are we going to control AI? How are we going to safeguard ahead of time? We have to have these things in place long before we actually have AI. Isn't, though, isn't it true, though, William, that eventually some bad actor is going to be able to develop this and not put those safeguards in, and we're not going to have a choice? Eventually, the, the downside of this is going to affect everybody. It, you know, it's, it's very true, and part of the reason why I say, right, we can't opt out of AI. We can't not develop it because then we're just at a disadvantage to anyone who does. Um, and it gets even scarier as you move out. So one of the things that I talk about in my third book, which is set in around like 2035, and that's, uh, I talk about neural implants. I think neural implants, so basically a computer implanted in your brain, the purpose of which is mostly to get information in and out, right? So instead of having a smartphone in our hand where we're trying to read information on the screen, we can get it directly in our head. It makes the interaction much smoother, easier. Um, and But it can also help um, tailor your brain chemistry, right? And so if you can imagine if you're someone who has depression or anxiety or a severe mental um, disability, that a neural implant could correct for those things. So, right? so you would basically be able to flip a switch and turn off depression or turn off anxiety. William, I'm, I'm wow. unfortunately out of time. Could I ask you to come back tomorrow and talk and start there? Because that's really the third book. Start with the neuro implants and, and, and where it kind of ends up with technology, because it is remarkable. And in reading the real science behind it, it's real. It's real. It sure is. Yeah. It's coming. Uh, could you come back maybe tomorrow? Sure, I'd be happy to. Okay, great. Um, thanks so much, William. Uh, William Hurtling, author and futurist. He is the author of the Singularity series. Glenn Beck. The Blaze Radio Network. It's Wednesday, January 17th. You're listening to the Glenn Beck Program. We had... Uh, we had William Hurtling on uh, yesterday, and I wanted to have him back on today to kind of finish the conversation. He's written a series of four books called uh, The Singularity Series. He also has his latest book, The Kill Process. Um, but but the uh, four in the in the series um, of The Singularity is is a really good explanation and a good view in an entertaining way to get a handle on the kinds of things that we are going to be facing Yesterday, uh, we were just talking about the technology that is on the very near horizon in the next few years and how that could affect us uh, all the way from, you know, uh, self-driving cars uh, to personal assistants that know you really well. Today, we want to look into what's just around the corner in maybe 15 years. We're closer to what we're going to talk about today than we are uh, to September 11th. We are closer to things that we only thought were science fiction than we were th- to the things that we grew up with uh, just in the last 20 years. So William uh, Hurtleining is uh, joining us again. Hello, William. How are you, sir? I'm great. Thanks for having me back. Good. Um, yesterday, we started talking about what's coming twenty. 20- 2030 2035 and that is the 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 merging of man and machine uh and the upgrade of of the human mind and the connection uh to the to the web can you kind of go into that and what and and how real this is sure um so we were talking about neural implants and you know i i know you've talked you've had ray kurzweil on a lot he likes to talk about the exponential trends in technology. Yeah. And I do the same thing. I have these spreadsheets that I look at technology. I look at various attributes. How fast is my connection to the Internet? How fast is my processor? How much storage do I have? How big is my computer? And when you look at these trends, one of the things that you see is that computers are getting very, very small indeed. And that means that 
we're on the horizon of the technology, everything that would fit in a computer fitting inside your brain um, and having the kind of direct neural connections that would allow it to be fully integrated with your brain. And there's research happening today um, to do this, to work with people who are paralyzed, who have no motor control because they've lost the connection between the brain and their body. So that's being restored. So there's some great medical benefits that are driving this kind of research, as well as just the need for um, our ability to get information in and out of our head um, or our ability to augment our intellect. So let me, let me go a couple of places with you. Um, I, have, I have read that we are just a couple of years away from making the neural connection to like a bionic arm. So you're much more like the $6 million man, if you will, if you were my age and remember that. Um, yeah, sure. that, that you, you control it exactly the way you control your hand now. Are we that close to that? We are. I mean, the, a great example is the cochlear implant, which is to correct deafness um, in people who have a um, defective portion of the hearing system. I don't understand exactly which part, but this is an implant that connects into the auditory nerves that replaces the function of the ear. And uh, what happens when they implant one of these is when it's first turned on, people don't really hear anything. And then over a matter of days, their brain starts to integrate the signals from this implant and their hearing gets better and better and then it becomes crisp and then it becomes maybe not back 100% to normal, but good enough for day-to-day life. And um, it's just an example of how adaptable the brain is to be able to interface with these um, external tools. So uh, I know there's a um, I know there's a guy who's a scientist now and and a guy who makes prosthetic um, limbs. Uh, He was a mountain climber uh, and uh, fell was didn't have use of his legs anymore, had had his legs removed, in fact, um, and was told, you know, you'll never do anything again. He went back to school and decided, yeah, I'm I'm going to walk again. And he went to MIT and um, he started studying and he started to make his own artificial legs. He is now a better uh, mountain climber than he was before because of these artificial legs. We're getting to a point to where in the maybe perhaps in the next 10 years, your artificial limb will be so much better than your actual limb that we'll have to decide whether doctors can remove a perfectly good limb to replace it. Do you believe that? It's, um, I, have a, I have a little bit of a hard time imagining whether or not we'll remove perfectly good limbs but I can certainly imagine that we're going to add on technology where it doesn't require moving anything, right? So if I could get an implant and I could be smarter or happier than I am today, um, I'm almost certainly going to do it, right? I'm not going to give anything up. And that leads to a very interesting sort of reaction because what happens when you want to send your kids to school and all of the other kids have neural implants, they're all smarter, and now your kid... If you, you know, have an objection to this technology, yeah, your kid's behind everybody else. So is anybody going to do that? What if you're looking for a job and you want to go into the workplace and everyone else has a neural implant so they're smarter? You know, is there pressure now for you to get a neural implant? So that's a really interesting place to me. So uh, I asked Ray Kurzweil that question, um, and he said, no, everybody will get one because they'll be cheap. And I said, but what about people who don't? want to get one and he looked at me almost confused and said why wouldn't you want one and i said well there, because there will be people who say i want to be natural i want to be i want to be authentic i don't want to be connected to all of that all of the time um and he he really didn't see that happening um which was odd i thought uh and he said well it won't cause a problem anyway and if you if you really think this through over time if augmenting the human brain is really effective, you will not be able to function in society um, as non-augmented. And I, I don't see how 
uh, not being augmented at some point doesn't become child abuse. Um, you know, doesn't, uh, you know, people, people would, would do not want you driving on the road when there's a bunch of self-driving cars because you're a danger in a society Absolutely. where the natural person can't understand what everybody's talking about. Don't you become a danger? Don't you have to be limited? Sure. I think one of the, one of the great things right though is society is pretty large. We don't all have to participate in exactly the same society. So even today, you may see some people who are going to make intentional choices about not having certain technology, not participating in a consumer or materialistic society. I think we're going to have to, we'll see even more of this. Uh, we're going to see a growing divide between people who opt in to all the latest and greatest technology can do, bringing us along to what people call sort of the postmodern era, uh, sorry, the post-human era, right? Or um, people who want to maintain that natural state. When people say um, that the end of, of humans uh, could be 50, 70 years away, I read that two ways. I, well, first, I, I read it uh, as, well, because Homo sapiens won't exactly be Homo sapiens once we start upgrading, um, then, th- then there's something else. Um, you're not a pure homo sapien. But after reading your book, uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm afraid that, you know, they, they actually mean that, that, that humans will not exist in 50, 70, 100 years. Where do you stand on that? I, I, I think there's a pretty good chance that we will either not exist or we'll be so changed that we can't imagine that from where we are today. I mean, I was having a conversation with my kids just two nights ago. Um, They're all of an age where they don't remember the pre-smartphone era Mm -hmm. and how we spent our time and they just can't picture it. And so what they imagine is everyone's just always got their head buried in a phone. That's just what people do. That's how the head has always been, right? And they can't remember that difference. As we move forward, as people are augmenting, as they're upgrading their minds, which I'm sure is going to have all kinds of amazing benefits, right? Yeah. Like every other piece of technology, it's going to be amazing. The temptation is going to be so strong. And yet we really, from where we stand today, we can't imagine what that new world is going to look like. Do you, Have you made a decision whether you would upgrade? Well, <laughs> you know, I'm one of these people, right? I see both the pros and cons. Yeah. I think I would go down that path. I think it will be an interesting adventure. And yet at the same point in time, you know, I know that there'll be things that we give up as a result. Um, I want to um, take you next to the basic question of what is life? Because I think that is one of the main things that we're going to have to um, uh, answer with robotics. Is that life? The moment they say, I'm alive, I can think, I'm, I'm, I'm self-aware, is that life? Is that not life? Um, uh, we're going to download, we're going to map your brain and we're going to download you and put you into a machine because your body is, is beyond repair. Uh, and, you know, so you'll live on forever. Is that really life? We get to that next. William Hurtling is the uh, author of several books uh, on technology, um, and the series of the Singularity series is the one that Glenn started with. The latest book is called Kill Process, which is a separate storyline. Uh, WilliamHurtling.com is where you can find it, or at H-E-R-T-L-I-N-G, at Hurtling on Twitter. Highly recommend the series. Just get it at Amazon, the Singularity series. When it comes to your mortgage, buying or refinancing... You need um, people that take away stress, not add more. And that's why there's American Financing. They're going to customize a loan program that will fit your financial needs. And if you're a veteran or if you haven't used your VA benefits, with interest rates this low, right now is the time to get a new home or to refinance. If you're looking to refinance or purchase, you should move forward as rates are still close to historic lows. And the salary-based mortgage consultants at American Financing are dedicated to helping you make smart mortgage decisions that align with your unique financial goals. 
American Financing. You'll get straightforward, effortless mortgage experience, so call them now. American Financing at 800-906-2440. That's 800-906-2440 or AmericanFinancing.net. Go there now. American Financing Corporation, NMLS 182334, www.nmlsconsumeraccess.org. Glenn Beck Mercury. Glenn Beck. The author, William Hurtling, he's an author of a um, uh, multi-award-winning uh, series of books, uh, the Singularity C- uh, series, the Avogadro Corp is the first one, AI Apocalypse, The Last Firewall, and The Turing Exception. Um, they are really good, take place over the next 40 years, and kind of show you the things that we are facing in a novel form, and it's it's really exciting and and really enjoying and you will uh, uh, you, you will really learn a lot um I, without giving away you know anything in the in the end let me give away the end of, of the last book you have people digitizing themselves and and going out into space because the world has been lost to technology and and uh uh to ai um uh is that uh, how do we deal with the idea of that's not life that is life how do we deal with that with computers and and with robots because i think that's the first place we're going to see it yeah the the obviously we're going to have um robots or ai they're going to talk to us and um they're going to say, hey, I'm alive, don't turn me off. Right. Now, if your computer said that to you today, you would know that that's not real. Um, but they're going to keep saying it, and the AI is going to keep getting smarter. And one day, there's going to be an AI that's going to really seem like it is alive. And then we really have to think about two things, which is um, what does it mean what is our relationship to this other thing, right? Is it something we own? Is it our servant? Is it a person? Is it a friend? Um, what does it mean for them to be turned on or off? But what does it also mean for us? So an example um, that I actually got from um, Daniel H. Wilson, the author of Robopocalypse, uh, is an example he likes to give. So imagine that uh, you're out, you're with your kid, and uh, you get really frustrated at your car, and you kick to the car um, because you were frustrated that it wouldn't start or something, and your child saw that. Now, they might think it's a little bit odd, but they're probably not going to be too traumatized by you doing that Mm -hmm. um, because you're dealing with an inanimate object. Now, on the other hand, imagine um, someone gets frustrated with a family dog, and they kick the family dog. That's going to be a whole lot more traumatizing for that kid to witness, right? Because we empathize with them. So what does it mean if you have an AI that appears to be alive, right? Your kids are gonna think it's alive. I mean, think about how kids interact with technology today. It is, right? yeah. They're, they're gonna believe it. And so how trauma inducing is it to them to think about like turning off their AI friends or their robotic dog reaches the right. end of its life and we throw it away. Everything right? everything is about to change and I, I can't recommend highly enough. Uh, read the Singularity series by William Hurtling. It's available on Amazon. The Singularity series. Start it today. It's a Glenn great read. Back. Mercury. This is the Glenn Beck Program. The founders of the new group, New California, took an early step towards statehood uh, on Monday after reading their own Declaration of Independence from California. Uh, They say California has become ungovernable. And they said, what we'd like to do is take most of the current day California, including the rural counties, and leave all the coasts and the urban areas to, you know, California, California. 
They said the current state of California has been governed by a tyranny. After years of overtaxation, regulation, and monoparty politics, the state of California and many of its 58 counties have become ungovernable. Citing a decline in essential basic services, including education, law enforcement, infrastructure, and health care. The group says they hope to model their split uh, over what happened in Virginia, becoming the state of West Virginia. The authority comes in Article 4, Section 3 of the U.S. Constitution, and New California wants to be the 51st state. I will tell you that I, I, don't, I don't have a problem with this. I, I, I worry that we are dividing ourselves into groups where we just don't need, we don't even understand each other. So we're becoming balkanized. But, you know, I, I just don't understand. You know, there's people that want to, you know, they want the socialism and everything else. Good. I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. Leave me alone. You know, <laughs> you want to have your socialistic thing. Go do your socialistic thing. You want to be a state? Great. We're not going to bail you out if it fails. What part of uh, socialism do you think allows them to leave you alone? None. That's the problem. That's the problem. If it was leaving you alone, it wouldn't be socialism. Correct. Unfortunately. You're right. They're like, you know, there there have been experiments in history. We did this on one of the uh, chalkboards, you know, several weeks ago. chalkboard. Where they went into the people who initially experimented with the idea of socialism, and they did it in a way that was not Stalin-esque. It was not... Uh, you know, Castro esque. It was, hey, really good things. We we're gonna we're gonna all live together, and we're gonna do things to help each other. And and it was presented with a smiley face. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was done, unlike socialism is usually done, which is they say it's gonna be great, but in reality, they wind up murdering all their citizens. These were generally speaking good people. They were people who, with good intentions, who yeah. tried this. With the best of hopes. Yeah, they did drive out the old people. They didn't kill them, <laughs> no. but they drove them out. Once you, <laughs> we're once you weren't able to work, and once you weren't, uh, once you were of a certain age, you had to leave the community and go away from the family. So, you know, it wasn't. It we, you know, it wasn't a death camp. <laughs> Look, but... I, we're talking the socialism scale. Don't call me out for these minor, <laughs> you're right, minor okay, you're right, you're right, infractions. You're right. This is a happy one. This is the one of the better ones. But what they found out is that you know, without incentives, without making people, without people wanting uh, to better themselves, because there was no hope to better themselves. Mm-hmm. That was the design of the system. That the society fell apart over and over and over again. One of them it was even here in Dallas, Texas. One of the first oh, yeah. uh, examples of that. What's the name of that tower? The Heritage? Is it the Heritage? Uh, no. Um, What's the name of that tower in downtown? Reunion, Reunion Tower. Reunion Tower. That's right. Thank you. That was the name of the town. Reunion. And it was a... so Right downtown Dallas. Uh, it was a socialist utopia. Mm-hmm. And it failed miserably. Failed miserably, and it was with talented people and and people it's, with good intentions. It and, is the reason why Dallas is the city that it is, because all of these talented socialist utopians that had real skill uh, and real you know intellect, they came and they tried it, and when it failed, they all started leaving, and they were like, okay, that doesn't work. Uh, Let's try something else. And they went towards, you know, capitalism and freedom and they built Dallas. Yeah. So that one worked. Yeah. And that's the story of socialism over and over and over again. Um, So it it would be like we certainly have uh, elements, flares into socialism that other states try. We know that in California. And I mean, you know, uh, Vermont had, uh, you know, has massive ex- experiments into socialized health care and, and many, you know, we are obviously our country at some level has, has done that as well. Uh, you could have these little things, but they all they affect everybody. Y- these little socialist plans that eat up one, two, three percent of your economy and they just continue to grow all the time, wind up really affecting people and hurting the growth of an economy and hurting people and in lives, I, I but I go back to I, I I don't I mean look if 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 Californians want to try it you get all the best yeah. land you get all the you got all the coastland you get everything you get all the sweet parts well I think the mountains are a sweet part too and you know where you can actually grow food is also a good 
Um, but y- y- take that. Take it. I mean, I, I really would. If, if we could have a peaceful civil war, and I think most people in our country that were real constitutionalists would say, you pick the states. Give us 25. Give us the worst 25. Give us the ones that you just say. Give us your tired, your poor, yeah. your huddled masses. We'll, we'll show you. Because I have absolute confidence that when people are left to do what they can do, uh, they'll change the world. So give us the worst 25 states. We'll live there. Now, don't come in and don't blame us when it goes bad for you because it's going to. But why are we all having to be trapped under this socialist umbrella? Why, why, do we all, why are we all forced to live like, you know, the way half of us don't think we should live? In fact, we have a, we have a study um, out done by a Democrat presented to the Democrats begging them, stop it. You're out of step with the American people. You're out of step with the Democrats. Yeah. Remember after Romney lost, there was this big uh, postmortem and it was like, look, this is what happened. We weren't liberal enough on on, uh, immigration. (laughs) They had this big like that is kind of what has happened here. Right. It's it's a study of what. Hey, wait a minute. The Democrats lost. Why the heck did they lose? They shouldn't have lost this election. All everyone said Hillary is going to win. Why did they lose? Uh, and you kind of look at this and you say, well, maybe it's because you're taking everyone who isn't a hardcore Bernie Sanders supporter and tossing them to the side. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, you're embracing that hardcore left thing. We saw this with, uh, with Tom Perez as he, uh, when they talked about basically kicking everybody out that was not a pro-choice candidate. We don't want you running as a Democrat unless you are pro-choice. And like that is yeah, sure that's ninety percent of them anyway. But you know there have been ma- major politicians uh, for the Democrats, some of the most successful politicians that have been pro life Democrats. Mm-hmm. At least they say they were. Mm-hmm. Uh, and now you're saying, well, we're going to reject that chunk of the population. Is it a huge chunk? I don't think it's a huge chunk. But I, I don't a, think it's 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 more than that. We're going to get into this uh, research uh, tonight at five o'clock on uh, the Blaze TV on my show at five. Um, but again, it was done by a. Democrat trying to convince the Democratic Party they're going the wrong way and they're not listening. Um, But I think it's more than just, um, you know, pro-life. It's it's a rejection of God. It's a rejection of traditional common sense, not traditional values, traditional common sense. It's uh, becoming a rejection of science um, and it's becoming so radical that I think the Democratic Party in many ways scares Many Democrats, they're they're not going to say that out loud, but I think there's parts of it when they see what's happening in the college campuses. I think the average Democrat looks at that and goes, that's that's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. And and the pathway to the lunatic fringe is just getting paved uh, every day and making it easier to go that way. Look at Cory Booker yesterday. I mean, Cory Booker is in the middle of an essentially his audition for a 2020 run mm-hmm. senator from New Jersey. And he looks like a complete lunatic uh, harassing a woman in the Trump administration um, about immigration uh, and DACA and, and, and all of these other things. And he's trying to be more animated because he knows he ha- to, to, to win a primary. He's got to be as crazy as possible and look like he's got to out left Elizabeth Warren. He's got to out left Kamala Harris. He's got to out left all of these crazy people, Bernie Sanders, all these people that are already there. He's got to figure out a way to get to their left. And the only way he can think of doing it is waving his hands around and making his eyes big and yelling at a woman, which I thought was bad from Democrats. I thought you're supposed to. Uh, I mean, I thought that was mansplaining. It seems like what Cory Booker did yesterday was mansplaining if a Republican did it for Cory. I guess it's OK. Here's but, here's a clip of what Cory Booker said yesterday. I hurt when Dick Durbin called me. I had tears of rage when I heard about this experience in that meeting. And for you not to feel that hurt and that pain and to dismiss some of the questions of my colleagues saying I've already answered that line of questions when tens of millions of Americans are hurting right now because of what they're worried about what happened in the White House. That's unacceptable to me. And I've got a president of the United States whose office I respect, who talks about the country's origins of my fellow citizens in the most despicable of manner. You don't remember 
You can't remember the words of your ca- uh, commander in chief. I find that ex- unacceptable. I mean, if you see this video, and if you haven't seen it yet, his eyes are wide. He, he's putting angry face on. Uh, he's, he's trying to, I mean, he's screaming at a woman uh, in front of all these people. And it's interesting because, first of all, tears of rage. Did you really? Here's a guy, Donald Trump, they, every day they spend ca- calling him essentially Adolf Hitler. He's a dictator. He's insane. But, you know, we're supposed to believe that they believe that. And at the same time, if he changes the terms of their immigration negotiation, we're, expo- we're supposed to believe they're so surprised by that that they fall into tears of rage. Come on. This person's either completely insane and unpredictable and you should be expecting these things or uh, the opposite. We're going to get really upset that they change his changes his mind in a negotiation. Obviously, this is one of those ridiculous um Uh, grandstanding appearances that we get from senators all the time when they try to run for president. And the other thing is, too, what is he criticizing her of at this time? That she isn't answering the questions because she said she's already answered them. Is it you're really that upset because someone said, actually, I've already answered that question. What she's not saying she's not going to answer it. She's saying she's already covered that material. You're really going to get that upset over that. It's clearly overacting. You know, it's a guy who's trying to, go, you know, build up uh, a, a a pathway to this fake anger so he can get donations, so he can get, uh, you know, a, a little uh, a buzz from the grassroots. He's trying to build himself into a thing. And it's so obvious he's trying here because he's trying so hard to convince you he's mad right now. It really comes off as pathetic. I think he's going to connect with a lot of people on yeah. the left and not necessarily just the far left. I think he's going to come. Uh, you, you watch. I think he's going to turn out to look very, very balanced and very, you know, normal, <laughs> middle of the road. That performance is going to get him balanced? No, no, I didn't say that performance. But mm-hmm. I think he's. I think that's the way he's going to be viewed by a lot of people on the left. Mm. And the the problem is, is that our extremes are so far. I mean... We're talking Marxists, atheists, revolutionaries, people who are telling us that men and women, that that, that designation doesn't even exist. Uh, we're talking crazy things. And on the other side, it's it's hard to defend some of the things that uh, said by the the right and are being defended by the right. So you have all these people on both sides who are saying nobody's representing me. Nobody's representing me. I don't agree with them. I don't agree with them. That's the opportunity. Now, who is going to occupy that space? Do you see any politician moving genuinely to that space? No. The parties won't allow it. Love. Courage. Truth. Glenn Beck. You can imagine the air was thick with tension as FEMA agents arrived. U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, their armed security detail, they entered the warehouse. They were on a mission to see if the rumors were true. They couldn't be true. Hundred days after Hurricane Maria ripped through the island, half of the population is still living without electricity. Have you seen the satellite pictures? We're a hundred days, that's a third of the year in, and we still, people don't have electricity? Despite the aid, construction materials, everything that we sent, still they haven't rebuilt very much, and they haven't restored the electrical grid. So there was speculation that the Puerto Rican Electric Power Authority, or PREPA for short, had been hoarding these materials. Our teams went into the warehouse, and it was easy for them to see this was true. It was filled to the brim with equipment and resources. That that explained why FEMA agents were so perplexed by the lack of everything that the people needed in Puerto Rico. PREPA received the equipment to rebuild, and then they just didn't do anything with it. So while the people of Puerto Rico 
are forced to get by with without life-saving electricity every single day, their salvation is sitting in a warehouse. America should do something. We did. It's sitting in a warehouse. <sighs> Corruption. It has just got to stop. And all of our governments are corrupt. Government inefficiency, idiocy, and corruption, all at the expense of citizens. How many lives could have been improved, even saved, if PREPA just did their job and would distribute the materials to Puerto Ricans? It's Wednesday, January 17th. You're listening to the Glenn Beck Program. If I can geek out just a little bit, uh, today's kind of an exciting day for me. I've wanted to talk to this guy since I read his first novel, Fatherland, which is one of my favorite books of all time. I just love it. Um, And, uh, you know, I've never been big enough to be able to get him on. Uh, He also did, uh, I can't remember the name of the book, the code uh, i'll have to ask him about it another great book lots of great uh great stories um uh and great novels uh from robert harris he is the author of a new novel uh, munich and it is all about the munich treaty and um uh, neville chamberlain and what happened with hitler um, uh, but he he takes it the way he always does and um, works a, a new storyline into it. Welcome to the program, Robert Harris. How are you, sir? I'm very well, Glenn. Thank you for having me on. You bet. Uh, are you over in London? No, I live just outside, not far from Oxford, okay. in the country. Um, it, it's a it's a thrill to have you on. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about the uh, uh, the book, but I don't I don't want to spoil it for anybody, and I, don't spoil it for me because I'm I'm halfway through. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, it revolves around, uh, Neville Chamberlain and, um, uh, I'm not a real fan of Neville, Neville Chamberlain, uh, and, and he gets kind of a bad rap. Um, why are you, what, 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 what is your attraction there? And I, it, I, I seem to think that you are a fan of his. Well, I wouldn't say I was a fan, to be honest, um, But I do think there are some stories in history which are really quite opposite to what most people think. About 30 years ago, I did a documentary for the BBC television about the 50th anniversary of the Munich Agreement. It's going to be the 80th anniversary this September. And I discovered that it was completely different to what I thought. In particular, um, Adolf Hitler regarded it as a terrible defeat. And, and that alone, I think, most people don't understand. And um, I wrote Fatherland, as you mentioned, but I always had in my, the back of my mind a desire to write a novel about the Munich Agreement, and I had the idea of writing it from the point of view of one of the officials who flew out with Chamberlain to meet Hitler uh, in September 1938. And then I, then I decided I'd also have a German character who travels on Adolf Hitler's train from Berlin to meet uh, Chamberlain at Munich. And so you follow these two men who were friends who were at Oxford University together uh, as they head towards Munich. And it gives me an opportunity to write a first-hand account of both Hitler and of Chamberlain. So how much, uh, how much Robert, of the novel is, is really close to true? Uh, like for instance, the, the plot to kill Hitler um, at that point, it, was that going on? Oh, yes. Um, um, everything in the book, really, pretty well is true, um, apart from these two invented characters, um, Paul Hartman and Hugh Leggett, the German and the Englishman. Um, yes. Um, I mean, essentially what happened was that Hitler uh, decided uh, in the beginning of the summer of 1938 um, that he would, for the first time, invade another country. And uh, he issued orders to the German army to prepare to wipe Czechoslovakia off the face of the map. That was how he termed it. And um, the army came back and said they could reckon they could do this in about five or six weeks. Uh, and he threw the plans back at them and said, I want, it, I want to be in Prague within a week. 
and elements of the German army took fright at this. It was the first time that they really woke up to the fact of where Hitler was likely to lead them. And for the first time, there were contacts between opposition elements in Berlin and the British government in London. And there was a slightly crazy scheme if the British and French declared war to try and arrest Hitler. I don't actually think it was that serious, but certainly it was the real first beginnings of the rumblings of a resistance to Hitler as the Germans realized what, what, where it was heading. Yeah, I was surprised when uh, Chamberlain um, arrives in Munich that there were, you know, the Oompa bands that were that were playing, you know, uh, popular tunes from England, that the crowds cheered him. I, I always thought of, of the Germans uh, not for peace, and that's not what that's not what it was. Well, no, absolutely. There's no doubt in the historical record about that, that Hitler, according to all the reporters, including the American newspapers who were there, received much louder cheers whenever he appeared than Hitler got. And Hitler was furious about this. One of the reasons I wrote the novel was because I came across, um, there's a journalist, a German journalist called Joachim Fest, who was the ghostwriter on the memoirs of Albert Speer, the Hitler's armament minister. And this, in this diary... Um, Fest asked Speer one day back in the 60s, what did Hitler feel about Munich? And uh, uh, Speer said uh, Hitler was in a rage for two weeks after Munich. He wouldn't even speak to his private staff, which was unusual for him. And then it all came pouring out at a private social occasion. He said, the German people have been fooled, and by Neville Chamberlain of all people. And what he was referring to was that Chamberlain, because he was the architect of a peace agreement, the German people staged a kind of anti-Hitler protest in the sixth year of his rule by cheering Chamberlain loudly whenever he appeared. Mm. This infuriated Hitler and was one of the reasons why I think he drew back from attacking Czechoslovakia. So, as I was reading this, um, and you really kind of spell it out, very colorful, um, the... Um, the appearance of everything with Hitler uh, was strong and uh, militaristic and streamlined. And, you know, Mussolini is there, the same thing. And here comes a guy who kind of looks like a walrus and uh, another guy who looks old and frail coming to the meeting. Those two guys must have seen the English as complete... Um, things of the past and and just weak. Well, I think that that's true. There was a great contrast in Munich between, you know, the, the fascists, the Germans and the Italians, mostly quite young men uh, in their smart uniforms and these dowdy, uh, quite elderly civilians in their crumpled suits who've flown into Munich. But appearances are a bit deceptive. One of the other reasons I wanted to put Chamberlain in the novel is that he is he was a tough old bird. And, and, and Winston Churchill said that about him, too. Um, he was a really dominant prime minister. He, he, he bossed it and lauded it over his colleagues. And he was um, quite vain and arrogant in his way and as determined on peace as Hitler was on war. And Hitler, he drove Hitler mad um, because Hitler was not really interested. The pretext for war was to re the return of three and a half million Germans who'd been assigned to this new state of Czechoslovakia in 1919 after the First World War. But that, that was only the pretext. The reality was, of course, that Hitler wanted a war of conquest into the East, you know, the, the subject I cover in Fatherland. Um, Chamberlain was determined to keep Britain out of a war on this issue. We didn't have a Czech, uh, treaty with Czechoslovakia, but the French did. So if Hitler had attacked Czechoslovakia, the French would have been legally obliged to go to Czechoslovakia's defense, and the British would have felt obliged to stand by France. So it would have been like the First World War, with all the countries being dragged in. Chamberlain wanted to avoid this. So he actually flew to see Hitler, which was a sensational development, especially for a man in his 70, 70th year. And it was a grave mistake on Hitler's part to agree to see Chamberlain, because Chamberlain naturally asked him what were his grievances, and Hitler told him. And Chamberlain said, leave it with me, I'll see what I can do, effectively. 
And he removed Hitler's pretext for war. He said, well, if the concern is these three and a half million Germans into the Dateland, I'm sure we can arrange for them where the majority is, is German for those lands to be transferred to Germany. And this is what um, forced Hitler in the end to back down. Goebbels said, you can't fight a war on details. And Hitler couldn't do it. And so he missed that opportunity for war. And at the beginning of the novel, I put this quote from Hitler in the bunker in February 1945, when he said, we should have gone to war in 1938. September 1938 would have been the perfect time. And throughout the war, Hitler felt he was fighting it a year too late because of Munich. He'd wanted to invade France in 1939. He'd wanted to invade the Soviet Union in 1940. And instead, his timetable was 12 months behind. And in that time, the British, and more particularly perhaps the Russians, uh, rearmed massively. Yeah. Have you seen the movie um, Darkest Hour yet? Yes, I have. What do you think of that? I thought it was a good piece of entertainment. I thought it was a brilliant performance by Gary Oldman. Yeah. Because I'm sympathetic to Chamberlain slightly more than most people are, I know. I felt that it was unfair on Chamberlain because, first of all, who built the Spitfires that were fighting the Battle of Britain? Chamberlain did um, when he spent 50% of British government revenues on rearmament in 1939, an enormous amount for a country at peace. Right. And also Chamberlain, because of his experience dealing with Hitler, backed Churchill in rejecting any suggestion of listening to peace terms. And because Chamberlain at that time was leader of the Tory party, his was the decisive voice. And most people think that Chamberlain wanted to do a deal with Hitler. The opposite is the case. He supported Churchill very strongly and was the decisive voice on the 27th of May 1940 at the cabinet meeting where it was decided to not even hear what Hitler's peace terms were. Hmm. Um, uh, is there, when you're looking at today's world um, and you're seeing everything that's going on, um, your, your job, and you've been so good at this, um, you look at uh, history and you see missed opportunities or chances for things to... Uh, to have been different. Uh, wh- what do you think we're going to look back over the last 20 years and and say if this event was understood at the time, it would have changed things? Well, I think, you know, history is, um, is, a, is, a, is a beguiling subject because it enables you to go back and see where people went wrong. And another of the quotes at the front of my book is from a great British historian called F.W. Maitland, who said, you must always remember that what now lies in the past once lay in the future. Uh, Chamberlain didn't know that Hitler planned a Holocaust. Uh, Nobody could foresee exactly how the Nazi regime would go. You can only deal with things as they are, as they uh, appear to you. Obviously, there are huge forces at work in the world today, um, that we are finding it very hard to even understand, let alone respond to. I think they are a large degree to do with technology and the the way that that is completely transforming our society, uh, destroying the assumptions on which most of us have built our lives. It's a frightening time of change. And often after a long period of relative stability, which we've had since 1945, uh, this leads to a kind of complete revolution. In a way, the situation we're going through now reminds me rather of the period before 1914. Um, Mm. One feels that there's something big coming along. How I would deal with that, I I don't know. I mean, part of the point of my Munich novel is that these two men, these two young men, are sort of trapped by history. They can see they're heading to the chasm, the abyss, but there's nothing they individually can do, although they try to do it. And it feels that history has reached one of those points. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Um, that something big is happening. Yeah. And nobody can quite grasp it. Yeah. You can, you can, feel, it, um, you can feel it coming. Um, uh, Robert, do you have a second? Can you hang on while we take a quick break? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Hold on. Robert, Robert Harris, the author of the book uh, Munich. Uh, it is out now. It's a novel. Um, he's a tremendous writer. If you've never read a uh, Robert Harris book, you should. Um, And you can start with Munich, the novel. Mercury. 